My name is uh, Per Pipinospos, and I work at the University Library of UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. And I'm here today to talk uh, with you, Kenneth Rud, uh, Pro-Rector for Research and Development here at UIT, and also Deputy Chair of the uh, Research Council of uh, Norway, at the board of the Research Council of Norway. Um, besides these, um, these functions, you are also a professor of uh, computational chemistry, and you've been in this, in this uh, uh, research sector for several decades. So what are the main differences if you look back to the 1990s when you took your PhD, and today when PhDs are embarking upon a PhD project in terms of the research data and how to handle it? Well, I would say that uh, when I was a PhD student, the uh, uh, research data was largely a um, private set of data. Uh, of course, uh, shared amongst members of the research group. Whereas today, I think everybody sees the importance of data in, in advancing the scientific process and also therefore the importance of uh, sharing data, or at least to a larger extent. There is, of course, still uh, those that consider research data to, to be an uh, asset in terms of reaching publication, reaching new scientific uh, insight. But I would say there's a, a huge shift in terms of uh, openness uh, when it comes to research data. Yeah, openness. And also another familiar term is transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes research data cannot be shared uh, for sensitive reasons, if you work with patients, for instance. And, but still, you can be transparent. Um, do you have some examples? Uh, well, uh, there are, of course, the opportunity of uh, sharing information about the data. Uh, it's also much more customary that you uh, provide, say, information on how access to data can be obtained, uh, or in case there are uh, sensitive data, whether you can get uh, extract uh, non-sensitive information from that kind of data and, um, and in that way at least make, uh, make it the world aware of the fact that uh, the data is there, possibly, all given the circumstances in terms of uh, legal boundaries and so on, uh, also then perhaps be utilized. So you can still be transparent although you are obliged to keep the data as such uh, behind some sort of wall of access. Absolutely, and of course included in transparency is also the, the fact uh, that you should provide more information on how the data has been obtained. Uh, so for instance, although we are probably not quite there yet, uh, there is an increasing push to make sure, for instance, that if you provide analysis based on data, you also provide the programs you use to reach those conclusions so that others can actually go in and verify that yes, uh, again, assuming the data are available, that you, you, are, you can uh, check uh, that the, the analysis is also appropriate and the right assumption, because you often have to make assumptions in the analysis of data, that these are uh, legitimate. So that also increases the transparency in general. We mentioned that you're part of the board of the Research Council of Norway, and uh, the Research Council of Norway, exactly like the European Commission and other funders of research that indirectly fund lots of PhD students across Europe. They have this emphasis on as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Um, there is also this, this slogan called FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So as you just now, we go through them mm -hmm. quickly, findable. Uh, what, what are the requirements, so to speak, about research data? Do they have to be findable, and how? Well, if nobody can find the data, uh, then obviously they are not of much use. Uh, and it's also important that uh, the, this, um, you can find the data also in the future, so that uh, you need to have um, some kind of uh, identifier that is unique for a given set of data, and that is persistent. That means it will exist also if you search for a given set of data, um, say, 20 years from now. And that, I think, is also, uh, and that is important for reproducibility, um, because, uh, for instance, in climate science, uh, long time series are, are, are key. 
And that means you can't risk that part of the time series to disappear. So the persistency, in addition to being findable, is very important in terms of uh, uh, yeah, the reproducibility and, the, uh, and also the progress of science in general. Accessibility, we mentioned earlier, that sometimes it can't be directly accessible, mm -hmm. but it should be findable so that people will know that there exists and know how to, to access it. How then about interoperable, which is the third part of the FAIR slogan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that uh, is also that goes also to to the uh, combined with the fact that you uh, we, uh, that you need to uh, be able to find uh, the data originally. It doesn't help if you can't really read or understand, and uh, we don't know what the computers will look like in twenty years from now. So it needs to be in formats that that uh, that can work on different kinds of computer architectures, can be analyzed by different uh, programs. For instance, if you end up using for storing your data in proprietary data formats, which then requires you to have a particular set of uh, tools for analysis, uh, that, that prevents interoperability and that prevents access to the data. So you can, in a sense, then also uh, make them less accessible in this way. Uh, so that, that's an important um, point as well. And, um, and uh, there, I think we have a huge uh, mental shift that we need to go through. We often still perhaps think of data much the way we think of uh, articles that they are for humans. Uh, but really, data is more for computers. So things that um, to make it easy to analyze by algorithms rather than making them easy to read is important in terms of uh, also interoperability and making sure that we can data mine through all kinds of data uh, across all the servers in, uh, around the globe. I would guess that some research disciplines, this will be very difficult, if not impossible. Uh, if you work in the humanities or, or other sectors. So there are some PhDs out there that can listen to this program and find out, oh, this does not apply to me. But still, this transparency applies to all. Um, is that a correct assumption for my part? Uh, absolutely, and I think we should also be keep, keep in mind that uh, what we currently think is possible may uh, or impossible for that matter may become possible in the future. Uh, I mean, the, the big revolution now that goes on in terms of digital humanities shows exactly the fact that perhaps by digitalizing old uh, uh, records uh, used within the humani uh, humanities, can provide new cross-links by the, uh, our ability to data mine them. So, so uh, I would say uh, any kind of data, and uh, I think we also need to be very open-minded on what, what data actually can be. This can be images, this can be text, this can be numbers. Uh, all these uh, should be made available to facilitate future research that we don't see uh, today. I think it's very interesting, uh, an example from our, one of our local research groups here that, for instance, used machine learning on patient journals and, and actually discovered that the biggest indicator of whether a patient may have complications after an operation was what the notes made by the nurses in these patient journals, not necessarily temperature or other physiological variables. How then about the fourth part of FAIR, the reusability? Uh, so this, uh, this, of course, uh, is to some extent, uh, at least the way I, I formulated it previously, um, uh, related to interoperability, the fact that we must be able to uh, reuse the data um, in other contexts. Uh, they may be created for a given purpose, but uh, by providing enough uh, metadata on the context of these uh, data, it's, uh, they can be put into new uh, areas of questions. And that, I think, is also very important in order to also make science more effective. That um, we, instead of uh, several researchers gathering the same kind of data, but possibly for different purposes, we use the same kind of data for multiple investigations. Uh, but again, this, is, uh, this requires a new way of thinking. Uh, and, uh, but at the, at the same time, it creates vast opportunities. And I think it will transform the way we 
we in the future will do research that to a large and large extent we will um, base ourselves on data science uh, more than necessarily uh, gathering data uh, for a particular purpose. But this sounds like a lot of work. I mean, if I were listening to this and I was at the start, at the beginning of my PhD, I said, oh, how, how will I ever find the time? But is this investment in making all this uh, quality of the, your research data, is it worth it for a PhD, would you say? Uh, absolutely. I, I, uh, I, I believe um, that in the future, the articles, so the analysis of data will probably play, a, play, play a, a smaller and smaller role, but the quality of the data will uh, be more and more important because that will be what people will use. And once you make it uh, a common practice to cite data, and this is now possible by giving data unique document object identifiers, uh, investing in a good data set that other want to use will uh, improve your uh, scientific standing and, and uh, have a much higher impact of your PhD work. Normally, while you will do your PhD work, you get a few papers, write a monograph or, or collect them into a, a PhD thesis, and then it's there and some people may cite it, but your data set may live for much longer than I think in general the article will. Uh, but that requires that your data is of high quality. So although, yes, it is a lot of work, uh, I think it's an investment uh, well made. An investment for eternity, it sounds. Uh, I would hope so, yes, definitely, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned the importance of uh, having good research data uh, as a uh, basis for whatever you do as a PhD for your research articles, etc. But would you say as a reader of research articles, I mean, every PhD student has to read lots of other papers. Would you say that papers that do not cite any data are not uh, trustworthy? No, I wouldn't go as far as that. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the basic premise of um, science is that we, we have a great confidence in that uh, people doing science uh, have learned methods in an appropriate manner, that they follow a uh, general research code of ethics, um, uh, um, and don't put bias in, uh, into the way they analyze the data. Having said this, um, no one is uh, error-free, so errors can happen. Uh, and we do know that there are those that try to cut corners. So if a paper surprises you and the claims made are cannot be substantiated by data, then clearly that this is a, uh, a warning sign, I would say. So, so I think for the benefit of science, again, having the data available uh, would make it possible for you to go in and make your own assessment of the data, see if you reach the same conclusions as the authors, uh, and uh, make sure that they haven't done an error in their analysis. And, and all these things can also um, be not be, I mean, we do have the peer review process, but also that may miss some of these uh, instances. And, uh, and again here, also transparency is so, so, so important because um, uh, without being able to verify the, the original data, uh, cheating is, of course, much more easy to do. Um, so again, uh, that's an important point. And in my field, so I do computational science, uh, a long-standing controversy uh, in the field on, on two different programs giving different physical results turned out to be uh, due to differences in assumptions on, the, on some of the modeling parameters. And only when both groups were willing to open up their code and see the difference they made which was not central in the theory per se, uh, it was possible to show that no, there was no dis discrepancy. And again, that means in that particular case, this was a debate that went on for seven years. And that's not the way to progress science. I mean, you could have done great science for seven years instead of fighting over that particular issue. And if just because the data was not, uh, and the program were not available. 
Yeah, the investment in time spent by a PhD in making quality data that you prepare for publication when you finish your PhD. Uh, will this also pay off in terms of the ability to get a job? I've heard of something called the DORA Declaration. Yes, so the uh, San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment tries to, uh, or um, it, it addresses this issue that the article is not the only way of contributing to science. There are so many other uh, important contributions to science, like data. So the, the DORA declaration states that when you are being evaluated for a researcher position, uh, you should consider not only the papers you published, uh, but also contributions like uh, computer programs uh, or uh, research data sets and so on. And that is for the purpose of exactly uh, giving credit to the time you spend on producing high quality data. And as I said, this can be measured in terms of the impact the data sets will have. And uh, we're working on ways of making it clear what does it mean that the data set is of high quality? How can we verify this? And there is work at the European level with the European University Association that, that tries to set up all these kinds of dif different dimensions that you can contribute to science. And this also includes things like outreach and so on, and uh, innovations and so on. So it, it's, it really tries to, to uh, put emphasis on the point that uh, a researcher's contribution to science is not defined by articles alone, but it's so much more. And, uh, but uh, this is a work in progress. Several institutions uh, still haven't signed the DORA declaration, but there is more and more institutions that signed this. And uh, uh, so I think this is uh, definitely going in the right direction. Kenneth Jude, thank you so much for mm -hmm. your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.